the whole channel was just massively demonetized because they were demonetizing fitness channels that had uh, male nipples in the thumbnails and such. And, uh, and they were just trying to figure out their algorithm. And we went from like, you know, at that time it was maybe like 1800 bucks a month, which was uh, the ad revenue, which was barely livable. And then it went down to like 400 and, uh, and it stayed there for about four months. Boom! We're live. Tom Boyden in the house. How you doing, my man? Great, man. Thanks for having me. Dude, I'm stoked to, to hear and, and finally have you here. I've been following your journey for a while. Grip Genie seems to be crushing it. You're always doing something creative. You're always, I feel like your brain's moving at a million miles per hour with so many different ideas. Have you always just been a creative human? Uh, I don't think I've always been creative. I think uh, it, I needed something to get me moving in a creative pattern i've always been uh i guess like, i don't know a talker and a a bit of a you know a bastard in school i was and and uh kind of i would say that i was creative in in things i did at the time but none of them were art or photography or or video or any of that and i don't know why i wasn't interested in it as a kid i was more down with video games and and just playing a massive amount of world of warcraft uh, wow was, wow was the circus i played warcraft 3 reign of chaos not wow i was into like the strategy yeah i got you that's that's better i wish i was not into wow but i mean there were like there were things that like in that game i got super creative and i was very like you know uh, I, I can look back on it and my friends will tell me how i would just be the you know I, I was the most serious about doing the most amount of damage in in world of warcraft you know and to do that you had to kind of like get creative and, and find all the different ways to uh you know just dodge dragons so <laughs> the, uh, but uh yeah it's just uh, it wasn't until i picked up a, a video camera that i started like kind of getting creative but uh yeah, it's it's. I have two sides. Like my dad's a f financial dude, super logical, not creative whatsoever. And then my mother is a graphic designer and she's a costume designer, and she's she's the she's the lady that I think gave me that. That's cool. How did the um the journey start? So like like college, were you you know what were you doing in school? Did you end up using anything you learned in school? Like where where did that take you? Well. Yeah, I mean, school was kind of weird because I got Crohn's disease my senior year of high school. Uh, I was diagnosed, it was like eight months of misdiagnoses uh, right before senior year. So I was like, end of junior year, summer of before senior year, I just lost like 60 pounds uh, or four, how many pounds? I, I'm confusing my weight with what was, weight was then. I was like one fifth, one from like 150 to 115. I was just a, a sh stick of a person. Damn. And that blows. Yeah. And, but what happened was I ha had all these colleges that I had applied to and got in and, and waitlisted at some really good ones. Like, and, uh, and then I just got dropped because I missed tons of school and my GPA just tanked from 3.9 to like 2.6 or something crazy and, and just from failing everything. But uh, I went to UW Green Bay. Uh, to actually do a bassoon performance so i was a music major so i did uh, a bunch of I played in all the bands with bassoon and and really was taking bassoon seriously and then uh um one uh, and at the time i was playing this is it's gonna be this you, you've opened up a bit of a can of worms but at the time i was playing online poker and I was doing really well, but then I started getting into drinking heavily in college. And one night I got super drunk and lost $16,000 online blackout, woke up and it was just like, oh, I just lost $16,000. And I had made like up to that point, you know, a good amount of money, but not crazy. And that was a lot. I was you, like, went, you went full send blackout. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. And friend, my friends were around me and they all were cheering me on or something. And, and I was just blackout, just drunk oh, like, and high nice and morning. holy fuck. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was very, very unfortunate. So I, I got really sad and then started playing World of Warcraft again after having quit it and then dropped out of school. So then dropped out of school, went back to not doing school, went to a tech school to kind of get into a better school and eventually went to UW Madison, got a horticulture degree and uh, that's, uh, I dropped out. I, I kept dropping out back and forth and then would come back a semester later and finish. And um, I don't know. I, I was never really good at the school thing. Um, I would always just be in tons of student organizations. Like I was, I was the, uh, I ran a rooftop garden and a urban compost program and um, worked with the student farm and then was, did uh, social media and photo work with the, slow food is like a, a food organization at the university. So I would spent my time on that and then just kind of right. dipped into the school. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's pretty gnarly. You had Crohn's. I'm very familiar with Crohn's. I, I have some, I have a stomach issue called SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Okay. Um, so pretty much had to learn about all those stomach things throughout that whole process. But mm-hmm. Crohn's is pretty gnarly. Can you share a little bit about what Crohn's is to people that don't know? Yeah, Crohn's is a inflammatory bowel disease, not to be confused with in, uh, inflammatory bowel syndrome or irritable bowel, irritable bowel syndrome, which is uh, you know, which was kind of what what people were diagnosed with for a while until they started looking more deep into it. In the I think it was like early two thousands and stuff, they actually started recognizing Crohn's, but it was also a I think it should be lumped in with the Western diseases, diabetes and cardiovascular disease and all that. Cause it's gone way up due to the crappy diet we've had, but um, it's supposed to be genetic, but they, I think they just say that for a lot of things. Um, and my sister actually got diagnosed a few years after me. So um, maybe it is genetic, but uh, yeah, it, it's a uh, Crohn's and then ulcerative colitis are the two, flavors uh, of ibd and uh pick your flavor yeah yeah really uh, neapolitan style choices we got and then the uh, crohn's is the lower intestine and ulcerative colitis is more of the colon so i got i just had um you just have a re- giant reduction in appetite you have really bad uh, intestinal and stomach pain all the time uh, sometimes it leads to polyps. I had some polyps just lasered. Uh, and then it's also just certain foods really trigger it. Uh, stresses trigger it, but it, it's, a, it's a chronic disease and you have it for life, but it goes into remission. Um, and I'm in remission and I've been in remission for a while and it'll pop up with certain stresses like traveling for, I've, figured out that traveling for 14 days like after the 14 day mark is when I start getting messed up because all the different food and the different changes uh, start adding up. But in general, uh, I'm doing okay with it and I'm not on any medication and and, uh, I kind of took myself off the medication way back when because they gave me this medication called azeothorprine and it's a immune suppressor. So I'd, I'd have no Crohn's symptoms, but then I'd get, I got pneumonia and mono and scarlet fever and would be, have colds and sick all the time. And yeah, this is, this makes no sense. So damn, it like shuts off your immune system. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, my aunt's partner is a naturopathic doctor. So she kind of helped me out a bit with uh, diet and and supplements and and, uh, all that. Yeah, for me, uh, what finally worked for me, like after trying all the antibiotics and all that stuff, I used the, the elemental diet. So just like mm-hmm. all in on the ED, the physician's elemental diet, did it for mm-hmm. two weeks. And that's what like finally just calmed my, calmed my inflammation down because it's just crazy what inflammation is doing to the body. And, you know, you just let it build up and build up and build up. And because we don't know, like that's the hardest thing about when you get sick in any general, you just don't know, right? You don't get like schooled on it's the basics of being sick, you know, you have a headache or a cold or whatever, yeah. but you don't know what's good with your stomach. You're like, ah, you know, I'll take emergency, even though you don't know the science behind it. You're like, hell yeah, right. You know what happens. But it's crazy what's going on. And like the, the gut is the most undiscovered part of our body, like the microbiome. Like there's so oh, much yeah. research coming out every single day. It's fascinating. 
Yeah, it's it's a wild thing, and it's also just a wild thing to go through when you're 17, and you know they're all just. I remember doctors just being super confused why I'm anemic and why I'm just sucking at everything. And uh, I mean, the one, the thing that actually I got hospitalized cause I, I went to, I was, I played soccer and I was a goalkeeper and I, I went to this goalkeeper camp that I'd gone to for three or four years. And it was all the people trying to get college scouting. And I was, I was pretty good. I wasn't good enough to get D one or anything, but I was definitely trying to, see if I could get into a D3 school or something. And uh, I lost a ton of weight at that point. And I'm just trying so hard to do the goalie thing. We were doing sprints or something. And I just kept throwing up and I just lost and just a ton of weight over a, like a 24 hour period. And I had to be hospitalized. And that was like the, the, the turning point, but you, you don't really, at that point, I was so confused about what was happening to me. I, you know, it just was happening over time. And that was kind of the, uh, the end point, but, uh, it, it, it definitely shaped my, uh, a lot of like how I deal with things now because I'm, yeah. I'm much more easygoing. I can kind of deal with stressful things quite easily. So, yeah, I feel you. Something else that I think that is, is very interesting about one of your professions is the horticulture deal. So, you know, the, the art of practice of garden cultivation, so, I mean, I'm obsessed with just plants in general. I think everyone needs more plants in their life. It's scientifically proven to bring you more happiness. Mm -hmm. um, have you just always been about that? No, I, this is, the thing with me is that people and my friends will notice it is that I'm like, I go just like years, I'll, I'll go with over years, I'll just get obsessed with something and, and just throw everything into it and for some reason i just really liked you know food like the, the crohn's disease kind of triggered my relationship with food through exploring the diet more and then it got it went back to farming and gardening and and that got me super interested into it and hydroponics and and just uh rooftop and urban agriculture really i don't know it just really got me interested at the time and and uh yeah i think it was uh just some sort of events that happened after crohn's that led to it but i don't know i, I just and my family's not super into food or or farming but I don't know, yeah it was it was kind of a i just got really really into it it's so, cool to know the background of that when you do have crohn's and you have to know every single detail about your food and the spices that's in it and just to kind of understand you know organic non-organic just some of the right. basic things that make living with stomach issues so much easier right and uh and then just the the diet i mean if you're farming you're doing a lot of vegetables and and uh antithesis of what many of the uh doctors were telling me that I shouldn't eat vegetables and coarse things and that it'll ruin my digestion. And I, I actually did do that and it helped a lot, which is, uh, you know, a direct correlation with me doing the, the farming thing and the gardening. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you've had such a diverse experiences growing up. And that seems like to be something that's really been complementing your today skill set, which is you're crushing it. I mean, if you guys don't follow Tom on, on Instagram or YouTube, I mean, he's just a riot. Just very interesting. The, the content you put out is just, I'm, I'm curious what goes on in your brain. What makes you think of these things? It's just good energy, good everything. Um, but what kind of like started that? So you're a videographer, you're, you're out of school. I think you mm -hmm. mentioned founding a company called Flippin. Was that like immediately after school or where did that come in? Uh, no, I, um, I went... Uh, so it all well the video stuff started with tricking the video camera i got as a kid uh maybe yeah 17 18 when i started doing flips and and it was my family's video camera and then it didn't really i didn't really do anything with it but just film and you had to look at your clips to get better at at tricking you just fall a ton of times and you had to look at why you're falling and and improve on that and kind of self teach yourself to uh to do, do better. Cause there was no instructors for this, but that, that, I guess that camera kind of spurred the initial 
video stuff. And then I just, um, it actually was the combination of farming and food. I started filming farmers and interviewing farmers and, and, and filming food. And yeah, it just, it just kind of erupted from there that, that combination of media and food slash farming was what really made me go crazy with it. And, and just started doing pretty much everything involved that. So I, I worked for the, uh, horticulture department. I, I worked for, uh, multiple, just, uh, uh, food organizations and just did things for free for a while, just doing all kinds of video stuff. And, interviewing farmers and then i went on this bike trip that which was the big thing i I went to the to get my master's in organic agriculture in in the netherlands and completely hated it and and uh, luckily had a i had a student visa so i had sick amount of time and in europe i could stay there for just a long time and and uh, i decided to start biking around europe and just filming everything that's that's the dream right there that sounds awesome it was pretty cool yeah i i kind of filmed mini vlogs of myself and at the time i thought i wasn't as focused on myself my journey myself as as the farmers it was kind of like a there were there were two different things i made like a mini documentary with the farmers and interviewing them and and then um and presented that at some like uh, urban agriculture conferences and, and and a few websites featured it and then the other side was me doing like these small vlogs and small my my little journey thing so it was uh it was kind of like a lead in to what juji and i do now but it, it really that was the it was just like four months of me dedicating myself to filming a ton all the time and in every adverse situation you know i would I'd be biking through the UK and it was 15 out of 18 days it rained and I'm camping outside in a wet tent every day and I'm still just <laughs> filming all the stuff and, and I'm biking, you know, I'm biking around. So uh, it got me really good at just uh, dealing with any uh, filming and dealing with any situation. And almost just becoming comfortable with constantly having a camera on you so it's not yeah. weird at all anymore and you're not like thinking, oh, what are other people thinking about me? You're just like, nah, I'm just doing time. Like, Yeah, I, I never had that problem, luckily. I, I'm pretty shameless and, and uh, you know, Juji took, when we first started filming in public and he, he took a while to warm up to it and, and I was just, dude, we got, we got to just do it. We do it. And, and it doesn't matter. We, we don't care what people think of us. <laughs> and, uh, a lot of it comes from that and just giving uh zero fucks. And, and at this point it's easy because it's, it's the job, you know, we, then I was just doing it for my own personal things. I mean, that's like an art though, right? How to not give a shit right? Like to be able to convince yourself yes, to yeah. do it. Cause I think a lot of people want to go out and do funny stuff or do some filming or put themselves out there, but they're just petrified because of what could, I mean, it's the human instinct, you know, yeah. it's suppressing fear is that's a tough issue. I mean, it happens in every, every day of our lives. So that's cool that you guys build this relationship where you're just like, if one person's kind of wussing out, you're like, all right, listen, homie, we got to go. It's time to yep. make moves. You guys got that connection. That's huge. Yeah. And I think just everyone sucks at failure. I think everyone's super afraid of failure and, and that's super, that's understandable. Uh, you should be, but it's human nature to be afraid of failure. But when you, I, I have just a very, very easy time failing and I, I've just failed at so many things and just done something else and 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 tr- either done something else and realized like okay i gotta cut my losses or just kept plowing through and that's the i think one of my biggest attributes that separates me from from a lot of people i always get people messaging me hey man i'm starting a youtube channel and, and i'm gonna do this and uh, how do i do this and what's the best thing for this and like, you just gotta make 200 300 400 500 thousand videos and suck at them forever and then and then you'll finally get better at them and people just and that's so many skills i mean that's not just making youtube videos you can if you just if you fail at drawing for six months in a row you're you're gonna get better at the end of it uh, unless you know you got a special uh 
I don't know, you're drawing with a, a fucking fish, you know, <laughs> if you're, if you're using a spatula to, to paint, then yeah, you're not going to progress that. But if you got a paint brush, you got the paint and you've been doing it for six months, you're most likely going to get better. There's going to be a sudden surge in paint fishing after this episode. <laughs> yeah. One of my friends, Nick Ivy, just recently painted using tree bark. Yeah. He just used oh, like, nice. just took tree, like, uh, like little branches and just painted. Yeah. It. And That's now he's wild. like, you know, it didn't look that great, but it was for him. But to me, I was like, damn, bro, that, that thing's fresh. Like it's cool <laughs> yeah. to see the internet get more and more creative. And like you mentioned, fail fast, fail mm-hmm. as fast as humanly possible. You can't lose if you never give up. It's so cliche, yeah. right? But it's the it truth. Is, yeah. And just surrounding yourself with people that don't give up. And you talk about like you're all about this fail game. Is there a specific moment that you can think about that might be, you know, either funny or traumatic or something about you on these come up, even when it comes to YouTube or something where, you know, everything kind of went south in a way that's memorable forever? Yeah. I, I mean, there were two situations. Uh, one was during that biking trip. And then one, a YouTube one, I'll say the, the biking trip, I was on a small trail in the UK. And at this time, the only camera gear I had was one like very cheap. It was maybe like a $250 camera. And uh, I had it on the front of my bike because I would always want to grab it. And, and uh, I put it in a bag and then just uh, had the camera bag on the front of my bike. And I would... I just kind of ramshackled that together and I would always just pull it out and start filming. And the uh, one day I was going on this trail, uh, they have these canal trails that are really narrow right next to the water. And this guy just on another bike comes zooming up and doesn't, uh, didn't be, uh, have any sort of noise or horn or, or bell. And, and we were at this tunnel, thing and and it got narrower and it came up and he just ran into me and i i went into the canal this is like at 7 p.m right at dusk and uh and then he he was very unapologetic but he helped me out and i my stuff was all wet and i was you know obviously all wet and i was super (laughs) pissed (laughs) like dude what what is going on why why did you do this and then he's uh you know he had to run and he at least help me out but i was just stuck in it's almost pretty much night at this point it's very dark and i'm super cold everything's wet my camera's wet uh and i'm freaking out and i go to the first boat that has light and it's just this uh, this long story short it's a drunk guy named maggot and uh a drunk woman and they're just they're just having a good time in a, a small shack that he fishing shack that he uh, repairs people's houseboats in <laughs> and uh yeah there's so he's, uh, he's, he's a great dude yeah <laughs> yeah great guy let me in uh let me dry off and then there was a uh, just some sort of existential crisis between him and letting me sleep there because he has to shit in the morning in his houseboat and i would be in his way uh to shit in in the in the in the cabinet and oh, makes sense, right? Right, right. So I'm going back and forth, and and eventually I have to go outside, and I sleep under a bridge, just just with my sleeping bag because my tent's all wet, and it's just like it was just a horrifying night. And this was maybe three weeks into the trip, and I still had you know multiple months to go here. So that was a definitive point where I had <laughs> that's to a definitive. That's that's a point right there. You're like, Oh shit. Yeah. You're looking at the stars like, Oh damn. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Did not plan for this. But my camera went in, in the water and it was fine. I dried it out. Everything was fine with the camera. I was like, okay, well I did this and I just got to keep going. And, and, uh, and it, it doesn't matter. It was a funny story. That's a lot of, a lot of the failures you can just chalk up to just how ridiculous it is. Like I love just worst case scenarios i don't like just a small failure like oh i stubbed my toe and then i had to uh, you know i couldn't wear that shoe that day or something <laughs> the uh i just want something everything to go wrong you know uh yeah. so everything went wrong there uh and then i kept going uh but then on youtube i'd say the biggest hurdle was right when i went full time it's about a year of part time with juji and and really making no money just paycheck to paycheck and and I, I decided it was enough to move to charlotte my lease was up in new york city moved to 
North Carolina and make it happen because before I was just flying there and and uh, we got demonetized. It was like the big ad apocalypse at the time and the whole channel was just massively demonetized because they were demonetizing fitness channels that had uh, male nipples in the thumbnails and such and uh, and they were just trying to figure out their algorithm and we went from like you know at that time it was maybe like 1800 bucks a month which was uh, the ad revenue which was barely livable and then it went down to like 400 and uh, and it stayed there for about four months right when I moved uh, to, to so I had to it was a kind of a panic situation and but when I do that when when that type of thing happens i'm always on the horse to find different revenue sources and how we can make something else happen and we went to twitch and and we live streamed on twitch for a while just to get a consistent income and uh yeah and so you guys just like you know life hits you and you're you know just improvise yeah we had to because i had moved there and kind of pretty much just picked up and left and and put all invested all my cards in this and it was yeah i mean it was a volatile decision but it uh i think uh you know i knew that if if it wasn't going to work out we i'd find other ways to make it work and and it so basically yeah we got demonetized and then it was a year and a half ago we had had some mild successes at that point and we had done a ton of videos we had been doing like when john was in north carolina and i was in New York, we were doing a video a day. He would film and I would edit. And, and whenever I was there, we'd do a video a day and, and we were releasing a ton of stuff and it was not getting much traction. We were getting, you know, a reasonable like 30,000 uh, would be an average video. 15,000 would be a crappy one. And sometimes we would get some good videos, but not very often at that point. Our biggest video was like, 600,000 views and that was by far the biggest the next biggest was maybe 250 300 and it was and those are random they weren't oh i figured something out and i know how to do youtube those were just completely random um clickbait kind of titles that i didn't really know at the time would pop off but they did and i didn't it's hard when you do when you get two videos that kind of pop off over a year you really don't uh, over a year and a half it was you don't so, think you really know you don't have it down no you know, i had no clue what was what was a recipe but may of 2018 i had also been tracking i had a huge spreadsheet of all yeah. of the fitness youtube channels and i tracked them for about a year and a half from like 2016 december i kind of did like a qualitative I had, I had this kind of rating scale of them about how many videos or how many subscribers they got per video and who was growing the fastest. And I looked at the people that were doing the right things and then just started kind of emulating what they were doing in their titles and such. And then emulated a lot of video game channels in their thumbnails. And then just kind of combined that uh, alongside like YouTube, the content doesn't matter. No, nobody watches the video. They don't care about the video itself. It's like, they the they're clicking on it because of the title and the thumbnail and more so saying that the title and the thumbnail are the most important things and at that point i knew how to make a good video but nobody was watching you know no. yeah and and it'd been juji and i think at that point at may of 2018 had made a hundred plus videos together 150 so and i had made a hundred more than that beforehand so at that point i knew how to make a good video i just found i started putting the pieces together on thumbnails and titles i made content schedules with guests and i made all the titles beforehand all the thumbnail ideas i would draw out beforehand and this was kind of the culmination of a, a lot of hard work and just thinking of ideas and, and and doing really well on thumbnails and titles and then this was like i was talking about bringing the grip tools to rock climbing gym for a long time was like, dude we got to bring them there and and test these guys grip and for some reason and that video just went crazy and that was our first million view video after just two days like wow two days it hit million views and that was our first one and it was it was pretty wild it it just bumped up the channel we got almost a hundred thousand subscribers 
in in maybe two weeks. Damn. And, and I immediately contacted Magnus Mitbo, who's a rock climber and one of our favorite guests, favorite good friend of mine, and contacted him. And I just kept the ball rolling after that. And then the channel, yeah, grew. I think that point we were at maybe two hundred uh, four two hundred thousand subscribers, and then that was what a year and three months ago and yeah so it just it just erupted after that and and then kept the ball rolling and now you've hit over a million yeah now we're at a million and uh the channel's kind of slowed down right now because i got super burnt out um and juji and i kind of are in this uh i, I like to it's like i i talk about it as if it's bodybuilding or powerlifting like different uh, seasons yeah like you have a bulking season you got a, a a cutting season and then you've got a maintenance period right and right now i'm just in in maintenance with the youtube channel because it, it takes a lot of effort to uh to make really really good videos and to to plan really good videos and to to collaborate with people and and to keep up with our own training and and all that is aside from the other businesses we have. And, <laughs> and it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. So I'm kind of, I make a decision at, at a certain point, like, okay, I'm going to chill on the YouTube for now, just make videos, but not kill myself to make them the best ever or, or make, uh, put all of the effort possible into them. Because if I did that for, I, you can't do that for five years straight. You know, you can't, yeah, I think that's that's really important you're talking about this because, you know, people will look at your success and you and Juju's just teamwork and they'll think, oh, well, they just got the secret sauce, but there's no secret. You're just, you no. all, you're, you're losing your, your ish day in and day out, just yeah. using every brain molecule in your, in your head just to figure this thing out. And, and like you said, you're doing a video, but it's not getting what you want. It's not getting what you want. Eventually, one day you get that pop off, which is a huge theme of, of what we can do today. Like you start a company, you can get one video and if it pops, that can drive traffic forever. Yeah. And that's true. such a gnarly world we live in. So it's like you and Juju, it seems like the two of you have been through a shit ton together. Like when did you guys even first meet? We met in 2013, but going back to the tricking and flipping and all that stuff, he had a website called trickstutorials.com, which was a forum that a lot of the backyard trickers that were uh, trying to learn how to do this stuff on their own. Can you, can you say what tricking is, by the way? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, tricking is a, we call it an aesthetic blend of martial arts with gymnastics and breakdancing. Martial arts, it's a lot of martial arts. Uh, wushu, karate, taekwondo, uh, capoeira, uh, and all of those, you just take the flashiest elements pretty much. It's, it's essentially a dance or, or a gymnastics, like a combination of dance and gymnastics routine in, in, in its aesthetic. And it's not, it's not a fighting method, but you do martial arts kicks and just combine them with flips and twists. And it is pretty hard to learn. And that would be also a definite, uh, a definite spot to look at in terms of failing well, uh, because I would say the first uh, <clears throat> 2007, 2006 is when I started. And I would say the first three years I fell about 90% at the time. Uh, and you just don't land anything because you have no idea what's going on with your body. You don't know how to control it. And, yeah, I would just, I just ate shit for, for many years. So, <laughs> so, uh, and, and then, uh, Juji had a forum, which I found, uh, this is, you know, back before Facebook and Instagram and that was popular and you would go to forums to figure out stuff. And, and he had a forum that everyone posted on that did this tricking stuff. And I was one of the few from Wisconsin and I found a friend of mine, uh, actually he's a legally blind dude who did tricking crazy dude uh can't see like three feet in front of him but he does flips like it's his he's he's got some sort of superhero ability but i found that guy and then uh, i started getting better because i was training with someone and and then started filming and looking at what i was doing wrong and got a trampoline and and got a lot better but uh nice. juji and i met uh, i guess i had been doing it for six or so years at 2013 
at that time was doing a lot of video stuff and uh, uh we had a mutual friend in chicago we met in chicago made a video called the juji sessions which was a very uh fun video to make i put a lot of effort into it uh and that was kind of uh the first real time that we uh, made a video and then uh, we met a couple times after that up to 2014 and just did some random videos but I was going through a bad breakup and just just confusing in my life at the time drinking a lot and doing a lot of drugs and stuff so I was not in an ideal space but he interestingly enough he had a Facebook page in 2013 and wasn't hadn't done Instagram yet. And I was doing Instagram cause I had an organic agriculture and urban agriculture blog. Right. And I would post pictures of, uh, beautiful pictures of, I don't know, plants and shit, you know, uh, yeah, and food of <laughs> <laughs> on Instagram. And, uh, yeah. And, and I told him like, dude, you gotta do Instagram. You'd be great at it. And we set up his Instagram that day. And then I, we just kind of lost touch for a couple of years and he did really started doing really well on Instagram in 2015 and I didn't, I had really no clue. I wasn't, I was in my own zone and, um, yeah. And then I went into film in New York city for a few years, a couple of years, and then, uh, kind of reached out to him in 2016. And then we started doing stuff part-time together and, and went, went far from there. That's cool. I mean, you, you built a friendship, you guys both testing the water, seeing what works. You think, wow, there's an opportunity here the foundation's built, the teamwork's built, you just needed the vehicle, you found the vehicle, you went all in on it. And, you know, you guys are doing big moves now. You guys got the thing Grip Genie going on, which is just very interesting. I know we were talking before the podcast started and you're just talking about all the behind the scenes work that goes into it. You know, tell us a little bit about Grip Genie and this company you guys are doing and that's crushing. Yeah, it was actually, um, you know, I, I'd like to say it was a, a cool story of how we started it or uh, even say a, a heroic story, but it was actually a story of spite. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was me just uh, being pissed at a, a grip strength company who I won't name that wasn't really supporting us in our videos, even though we had bought their products and we had used their products in a ton of big videos and millions of views we had garnered a, attention to their products and and they just wouldn't support us all it was the point that really changed everything was when we asked them if we we were going to do a giveaway for our viewers and uh they uh they said no you got to pay for that and i was like oh man that's that's really unfortunate that you've done this (laughs) and uh that was the moment (laughs) yeah that was the moment and that was august of 2018 and it was September of 2018 where Juju and I were brainstorming and we were in his car and we just had done a road trip and we were both kind of at that time we had just done too many YouTube videos and we were kind of it's a similar situation we were kind of losing ourselves a little bit and going too hard on it and losing kind of that energy that's that that good energy that people like watching and and uh we were in the car and I we were just trying to think of names and I just thought of Game Genie the old video game company they make a like a cheat code device uh, back in the day you would plug it into your console and and it would give you cheats so uh it was kind of hacking your game and then uh yeah i just thought of adding grip to it grip genie and then doing a lot of retro video game styling branding and and both juji and i juji had played retro video games and i was big into video games so it kind of combined that that and and the level idea of leveling up and levels like the the grippers are all levels and it's yeah i just thought of that idea and then we had a soft release we had a north carolina manufacturer we did a soft release in october 2018 from our late october november 2018 and it sold out really quickly did really well but we we didn't have great margins and uh the products were okay yeah and then i just spent pretty much six months just sourcing the manufacturers going over prototypes and going over designs and going over styles and and uh and then eventually released getting 
all the products and releasing all the stuff and the, the website and the branding and all that in, in March and at the Arnold Fit Expo. Who particularly benefits the most out of having insane grip? You know, climbers come to mind at first, but mm-hmm. is there like a big demographic that you didn't think would be a huge customer that has exploded? One that kind of jumps out to me is uh, baseball. There's a baseball coach that has talked to me a few times and said how much he likes the the hub, which is the you grip it like this, like you, your hands grip it around this circle, and and it's your finger strength, just almost like a like a ball. And he uses it for his pitchers because it, it allows them to grip the ball better and and throw better curveballs and sliders and all that. And that was super interesting. But right now, our demographic is very much barbell and, and powerlifting and strength sports and strongman focused, just because that's our, our audience on YouTube. And we haven't, uh, uh, because of the lack of grippers, it, it's, um, it's been hard to, to introduce them to other people. Uh, because the the grip strength stuff like the hub the the pitchers have been using and these tools that you load onto a loading pin which is loading pins on the ground you put weight on it and then you lift up with these different grip tools but those no one's going to buy them unless they are introduced to grip strength so (laughs) you have to the the grippers are kind of what we catch people's eye with and then and introduce them to grip strength and then once they get a loading pin they can just have open up the world and that's the that's the when it starts getting really cool and and you can try out different types of grip and and improve different parts of your hand and wrist strength and and develop your forearms and all that but uh like i said we had inventory manufacturer problems with our grippers and that was uh, uh that kind of just delayed a lot of things and we just figured them out in the last couple months so yeah, that's big. It's cool that you have the name for this demographic, Grippers, because yeah. it's, it's really cool when you can put a name behind your tribe or your following or the type mm-hmm. of people that are buying your product because it really makes them feel more attached to the brand and gives them an identity, uh, which is just very interesting in human psychology, how that works. You know, I'm constantly always thinking, how can I you know, brand the people that even follow the show or the podcast or just the Jones brand in general? Oh, yeah, yeah in a way that, you know, really is more inclusive of everyone. You know, our brand, our thing is, you know, it's a damn good day to have a damn good day. Mm-hmm. You know, just good vibes, good energy. Um, but it's just interesting that all those little things, I'm a big fan of, of uh, Shailene Johnson. She has the Build Your Tribe podcast, really yeah, good yeah. online marketer. Um, and just always talking about building that tribe. And you guys seem to be experts at building that tribe with the following you've built. And you guys, you know, I mean, you work your ass off, but you have fun. I mean, like you guys, oh, yeah, are, yeah. you're, you guys are gooning, like living the dream, and and that's really inspiring to to see. Yeah, and it it's uh it's odd to have have fun for a living because then you don't uh I don't really do anything else uh like outside of videos and stuff. I have other things that I do. I'll, I'll play some video games and I play online poker and and that type of stuff, but. I don't really, I don't, I don't go out and I don't do that stuff anymore. And, and, uh, I just like, uh, yeah, it's just kind of interesting the way the, you know, if your career is this type of thing, you, you end up doing everything outside of it a little, a little differently. Yeah. You, you build the life around. So if you could could have go back, right. And take everything you've learned today, maybe fresh out of college and you could have said, you know, one, two or three things to yourself, like old, older Tom talking to younger Tom, like, listen, homie, we got five minutes. You know, what would you say to yourself that you think could have saved you a ton of time, money, headache, any of those things? Let's see. College Tom, just drop out earlier. Uh, (laughs) Don't go back. Just do your own thing. Uh, and then say no to more things w- would have been good because I said yes to a lot of projects that really destroyed me mentally and, and uh, that I couldn't finish that, uh, you know, I regret a lot that I wish I not, had not done in the first place, uh, though I had to do it because I didn't have enough money and I was trying to do this as a career with video. And that happened when I was freelance a lot. I got into a lot of projects that I really just didn't want to do at all. Yeah. And, you know, editing a documentary on beer, you know, it wasn't my thing. 
uh, <laughs> it's so the, uh, that was, what I was saying, I would say, don't, uh, you shouldn't have sold 16 Bitcoin at $600. Um, the, <laughs> <laughs> right. And obviously there's always like, you know, I wouldn't change anything because, you know, right. it made me who I am today. Yeah. But there's a lot of things that, you know, didn't, didn't. Need yeah. To and that's happen. the whole, pe- that's the whole point. <laughs> people listen to this show and listen to people like you is to, you know, try to save yourself some of these headaches because you can learn yourself, but it's tough if you got to run into walls and mm-hmm. fall on your face. And if you're a tricking like you, you're just going to, you know, beat up your body like crazy. So you right. know, the last kind of staple I'm real curious about is what would you kind of say to that person that's right on the fence of starting their first business and kind of mm-hmm. jumping into it and just something's holding them back? The first business is you know it's it's probably not going to go the best so that's you just kind of don't have to expect that this is going to work out and it's going to be profitable or be the best uh, the best thing you could ever do because there's so many uh, so many entrepreneurs and business people have multiple failing businesses before they, they find the successful one so I, I wouldn't put all eggs in one basket just get started immediately i uh, you know, I, Grip Genie was not my first business, you know, I, I the YouTube and, uh, I did a t-shirt company and I had a freelance camera business and, and all that stuff was very much, uh, you know, work towards this. And I'm at the point in the business where you can have a business and it can succeed, but to actually take that and, and, and grow past that and find that that special something, all of this stuff is available on the internet to have a profitable and successful business, but to really make it into something spectacular and something different that there's kind of tipping point. And and I'm kind of at that with grip genie where I have to get creative and find a lot of different things to do that the industry is doing or that I've looked at or, or, and just, it's kind of like what I did with the YouTube is what, right. what point I'm at with the Grip Genie stuff. So, so it's straight taking it back to the to the whiteboard, seeing what works, mm-hmm. what doesn't work, doing everything you can, and keep trying new stuff. Exactly. And now instead of just a YouTube channel where Juju and I rely on the income, now it's eight employees. You know, <laughs> so now it's just all these people that rely on me to uh to, to figure out the the way to make it more successful. So it's a it, you know, it's, that's the thing with business is, you know, it's, it, when it's, when it's just yourself failing, it's pretty cool. But, uh, when you're, when you got other people, uh, that are relying on you, you really have to take it seriously and you really have to, uh, have to decide to, you know, make it successful for them as well, which is a very, very different mindset. It, it definitely changes things a lot. Dude, that's awesome. And it's cool that you're just super real and you just say things exactly how they are. I mean, you're extremely authentic and, you know, you're very just open about talking about your successes and your failures, more importantly. And, you know, we're going to fail a lot to get to where we got to be. So your story is really awesome. And, you know, we really appreciate our audience is definitely going to appreciate this. And I know that there's so much value that's going to help people get to the next step of where they're at. So next time you're out in Cali, bro, you got to come meet us up. Most definitely, and uh, yeah. hopefully it's not burnt down by now. Unfortunately, there's terrible fires going on in Sherman Oaks. It's straight just we got. It's not good. It's not good. But yeah, we don't have. Uh, there's no fires in North Carolina. Just uh, just a lot of mud and sometimes hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> Just sometimes. It's just sometimes, yeah. All right, man. Well, yeah, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. And uh, till next time. Appreciate you, man. Thank you for listening to another episode of Len Jones Party of Two. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review and subscribe to stay up to date on our new episodes. And remember, hope is not a strategy. Keep making moves. Till next time, peace.